Good morning and welcome to the newly renovated Poly High School Auditorium. So this is brand new for that for Poly and just brand new for some of you. So we're welcome to this beautiful new location. I'm Mr. Davis. I'm assistant superintendent for high schools for Long Beach Unified. Some of you may have seen me walking around your campuses or in your classrooms and probably many of you have not. But so it's a good opportunity, a good opportunity for me to, to for you to see me. Um, some of you have uh, and I want to thank you for joining us today for this important event. But before we begin, I want to do a couple things. Please put your cell phones away so that you're giving the speakers and myself your um, undivided attention. So I'll give you attention to put them away, for, uh, either put them down or in your pocket. Thank you. We're blessed to have this, been given this opportunity to hear from a world-renowned and world-record-holding female pilot who will share her life and life experiences with us today. Any honest adult will tell you that we really don't know what our future holds. One goal of Long Beach Unified is to prepare you as best as we can for the opportunities that will come your way, and they will come your way. And so today's speaker will give you an opportunity to, to look at when something comes your way, what you could possibly do for it. Our hope is that you'll learn from and be inspired by Captain Ways to pursue your dreams no matter what the odds may appear to be. And she'll talk to you about her odds and how she overcame them. Today's event was an unexpected opportunity provided by the National Business Aviation Association of Schedulers and Dispatchers. The members of this organization represent the private airports that operate in the United States. In Long Beach, the private airport operator that is supporting today's activities and tomorrow's activities for students is Signature Air. The National Business Aviation Association of Schedulers and Dispatchers, they're holding a national conference here in Long Beach this week. And in a rare moment of people, because Long Beach has many converse, uh, conventions here, but they asked if they could do something with our students here in Long Beach. And we are very excited to have this opportunity because we just don't have it happen very often. And it supports the work-based learning opportunities we're trying to provide for you students. They wanted you to learn about aviation and dreaming big because they hope many of you will possibly work for them in the future. There is a huge need for young minds like yourselves in their industry and they want to give you an idea of what's out there for you. Representing the National Business Aviation Association of Schedulers and Dispatchers today is Amber Fincham, and she's from State Farm Insurance in Illinois. And Holly Whitaker is from Exclusive Air in New Hampshire. So the exciting thing about all this is, is that with, through the internet and through phones and things like that, we were able to set all this up, and I only got to meet them last, uh, yesterday morning. So please give a, 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 a round of applause as they come up to introduce Captain Shasta Ways. Hello and good morning. Thank you for having us. I'm Amber Fincham with State Farm, Holly Whitaker with Exclusive Air. We came to you this morning, we're here in Long Beach, as Peter said, for the National Business Aviation Schedulers and Dispatchers Conference. So I'm sure many of you, when you think of aviation, you automatically assume pilots. But our industry has so many more opportunities for people like you. There's scheduling, there's dispatching, there's ground service, there's uh, catering. catering, so many opportunities. So as you begin your next chapter in your life, maybe you haven't considered a career in aviation other than considering being a pilot. We want to share with you the opportunities available to you. Some require college degrees, others do not. And we are lucky to have with us Captain Shasta Ways, who shares a background similar to many of you, who has had this opportunity at the very young age of 30 to be the first American pilot to fly solo around the world in a single engine aircraft. So I'm sure that she never thought that she would defy gravity, fly at 200 miles an hour, and make it around the world to hold this world record. So we are pleased to introduce to you Captain Shasta Ways. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How about we try it one more time? Good morning, everyone. I like that better. 
So if all the seniors can raise their hand so I can see who our audience are. Very cool. What about the juniors? Whoa, look at those hands. Lots of juniors. Sophomores? All right, all the way in the back. Thank you for joining us. And how about the freshmen? Woo, very cool. <laughs> so, as it was shared with you all, my name is Shasta Ways, and I just recently became, uh, it's actually the youngest woman to fly solo around the world uh, in a single engine aircraft to inspire the next generation, meaning you all. Um, so what does that mean, flying around the world solo in a single engine airplane? It means May in 2017, I got inside a small aircraft, which I'll show you pictures. Uh, this aircraft only has one engine. It usually seats six people, including the pilot and the co-pilot. And me, by myself, got into this plane and traveled close to 25,000 nautical miles across five continents into 22 different countries to inspire young girls and boys like you to pursue aviation along with careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Are you all familiar with STEM in here? Okay, I figured. So today, I'm here with you to kind of share a little bit about this journey that I took around the world to inspire young boys and girls, and also introduce you to careers in aviation um, that a lot of you don't think about or haven't considered. So a little bit more about my background. Originally, I am from Afghanistan. I was born in a refugee camp, and my family came to the United States when I was about six months old. The picture that you see here uh, is with my father, uh, and this is in Richmond, California, so it's not too far from here. Um, and right behind him is the Pacific Ocean, and this picture was taken just days as my family came to the United States as refugees. Uh, the reason why they left Afghanistan back in 1987 is that there was a war uh, going on. Uh, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, and times were getting really tough. Luckily, my family, they applied as refugees to come to the United States. They were granted that opportunity. Uh, they got here, and my father, my mom, my older sister, and I, at the time, started our lives in Richmond, California. What's really cool about this experience is that the Chicago Tribune newspaper uh, had sent out a couple of journalists to follow families who were fleeing Afghanistan during the war. And there was a journalist who fo followed my family. So now that I'm older, I can go back and read this news journal article and really get a sense of what it was like uh, almost 30 years ago when my family came to America. And so these are just some clippings of uh, the article. And in the bottom picture, there's my grandfather playing the uh, traditional Afghani instrument, the rabab. My father, my little sister, uh, my mom, and my uncle. So it's pretty neat to have a flashback uh, into back into 1987 in Afghanistan. So this picture behind me of the two little girls, uh, that's me and my older sister. And I share this picture because when I was young, I was extremely shy. Talking on the stage or just talking in class was very difficult for me. It was so difficult that even when the teacher would call attendance, I sometimes wouldn't say that I was there because public speaking scared me. And then I'd go after, during recess, and tell her, you know, I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, you didn't hear me. But I was extremely shy. I grew up in a family with uh, five sisters, so in total it was six girls at home. Can you believe that? <laughs> uh, so growing up, you know, um, I'm the second oldest, having six sisters, growing up in a very big family. Growing up in Richmond, California, which for those of you who may or may not know, uh, it, it's, Richmond has one of the, the biggest underprivileged school districts in Northern California. Uh, so, you know, here I was, a young girl, I thought to myself, the only thing that life really has to offer me is for me to get married at a young age and have a family, like my mom did, and her mother, and generations before her. 
And I thought, I'm not gonna do anything great in life. I'm too shy for that. And I'm not good in school. I'm not good in math. I wasn't good in, <laughs> with reading. And I just, I didn't have the resources growing up in Richmond to really empower me and make me feel, or make me take education seriously. When I was 17 years old, so there's some people in the crowd, 17, um, I came across something that made me feel life. It made me feel like I had a sense of purpose. And that thing that I came across was aviation. So also too, growing up, I was terrified of flying. The only exposure, the only exposure that I had to aviation was, to be honest with you, accidents on CNN. You know, my family at night, we would watch the news and I'd see these airplanes and I thought, my God, aviation is so scary. Planes are so scary. I would never get into a plane um, unless if I, I really had to. And at age 17, I find myself um, at the San Francisco International Airport getting on board an aircraft. And I was just so terrified, so scared about this experience uh, that I was about to have. And to my surprise, when this aircraft started taxiing onto the runway um, and it started to accelerate and take off, I was shocked at how beautiful those wheels came off the ground and how we gently just started to uh, fly into the sky, and it was an experience that left me in my seat amazed. And here at, at age 17, thinking, you know, I'm gonna, all that I'm gonna do when I grow up in life is, is have a family, I was introduced to aviation, and that's all that I needed was that experience to really dream big. So I, I, went to a uni I went to a community college for two years because, as I shared with you, I wasn't the best student growing up. So for two years, I really had to prove myself in the sense of I had to take calculus and I had to take physics and just really apply myself to the sciences um, because there is a lot of science that is involved with aviation. And every time, it was tough, and I thought, I don't want to do this math equation. I don't want to study for this exam. I kept thinking about that takeoff that I had um, when I was 17 years old. And I thought, all right, hit the books. Once I started to fly, I, I initially wanted to get involved in aviation to be an airline pilot. And then I quickly learned that, you know, it'd be great to be an airline pilot, However, I want to do something with aviation that's different. I want to utilize airplanes to inspire young boys and girls and, and connect with young boys and girls who have a very similar background uh, as I do. And I try to look up job descriptions and I think, well, really, <laughs> what I want to do doesn't exist out there, so maybe I should just focus on being an airline pilot. And as I started to fly and feel more empowered, I thought, you know what? If that job description doesn't exist, I need to create it then. Because maybe someday in the future, there will be another young woman or man that will want to do something, uh, something very similar to the vision that I have, and they'll find that job description. So what did I do? I started a nonprofit organization called Dream Soar. And our mission was to inspire the next is to inspire the next generation of STEM and aviation professionals. So throughout this presentation, again, I'm gonna be talking to you a lot about careers in aviation. And that's something that you don't really think about. Nonprofit work, aviation, but there are several nonprofit organizations out there um, that you can be a part of that does a lot of good work around the world and incorporates aviation into it in one way or another. So, getting ready to fly around the world, I knew that I needed to focus on three major aspects to really get this trip going. The first one, I needed an airplane. The picture that you see is the Beechcraft Bonanza A36 that I flew around the world. It's not quite the airplane that you would think, right? That you would take to fly around the world? Maybe? <laughs> 
In addition to the aircraft being small, I had to carry a lot of survival equipment with me. So when I would get to flying across the oceans and across large remote areas of land, I needed to ensure that in case of something did go wrong, I was fully prepared and equipped to survive in any sort of situation. So this is how the aircraft look as, I, as inside of it as I flew around the world. You see a life raft, you see an oxygen tank, engine oil, um, and then you, these big massive silver containers in the airplane were fuel tanks. And those fuel tanks allowed for this small aircraft to actually cross the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Um, and how we engineer these fuel tanks, uh, one of our, the mechanics that worked on the aircraft, Curtis Bulware, is going to give you some insights of what these fuel tanks look like and how they were installed. And this is another career field that you could possibly go into if you like working on machines, if you like engineering, um, personalizing an aircraft, you know, this is a field that you can definitely go into that's you use your hand and it's, it's a lot of fun. So, Jill, if you can play the video. Hey everyone, Chef. Curtis Bulware from George Baker Aviation and Curtis is doing the taking install. Uh, Curtis, what would you like to share with us of what you've done so far? Sure, uh, so around the world trip takes a lot of fuel and the only way to get a lot of fuel is to add more tanks in the airplane. Two main tanks for ferry. Uh, the rear tank's a 166 gallon tank, and the front gallon is about a 60 gallon tank. And that'll give her enough legs to get for uh, her longest distance. The way the ferry tank system works is uh, no modifications to the airplane. She will just have to select her right hand tank and then choose between the original right hand tank or the ferry system. Uh, so, very simple, very straightforward. Um, she shouldn't have any fueling issues for the trip. All right, so that was the aircraft modified for this trip around the world. So I gotta be honest with you all, once the tanks were installed, I walked up to the airplane and I thought, wow, this is scary. <laughs> you know, it's so unlike what I was used to when I was flying that aircraft in its original configuration. And that's the thing about fear, is that you get scared at first, but as time progressed, I got used to it. And then it got to a point where I actually liked it because I felt really cozy and everything was within arm's length. And now when I get into airplanes that don't have these massive tanks, I feel like it's just strange because I've been so used to the aircraft configured that way for the trip around the world. So I identified the aircraft. Next was to put a flight plan together. Many pilots, uh, they establish a flight plan so that both the pilots, the air traffic controllers, uh, the passengers on board the airplane all know where is this plane departing from, where is it arriving, what time um, will it take off, what time is it expected to land, how much fuel is on board. You know, having this information is very critical. So I kind of used the flight plan concept and applied it towards, you know, the planning of Dream Soar. With, with uh, flight planning, you know, when you are dealing with international countries, it's very difficult to get certain approvals, landing permission. You know, oftentimes I thought, well, how do people fly from Dubai, United Arab Emirates to JFK? You know, how does that plane, how does air traffic control know that this plane is coming and to prepare for it? Well, it's all listed on the flight plan. And what I was fortunate to find was a flight planning company called Hadid, and they're actually based in Dubai, where I would give them my departure country, arrival country, all of the specific information that they needed, and they would generate a flight plan. So if you're very good with logistics, and you are excited about the world, all the different countries, uh, kind of like the rules and the customs in these countries, flight planning could be a very exciting career for you. 
In addition to you know, some items that I needed to address in this flight plan for the trip around the world, um, there were a lot of sponsors who supported the, the Dream Store Global Flight. And I wanted to recognize them by putting their logo on the airplane. And this was another career that I came across while getting ready for the Dream Store Global Flight, is aircraft decaling. You know, if you guys ever watch NASCAR, you look at these great cars and you're thinking, wow, look at all the stickers and the design. Well, there are aircraft detailers who detail the aircraft and uh, put these logos on, on the airplane to make sure that it looks symmetrical. And the video that I'm going to show you next, this is from our, our, one of our dream team members. Um, this is a student at uh, a, a university at a university called Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Uh, so this is a student who's going into uh, preparing the, the decals for the aircraft. If you can play the video. How's it going, everyone? My name's Alex Rock, and I'm the Vendor Relations Lead for Dream Soar. One of my big missions and one of my big priorities for this aircraft and for this global flight is the decaling of the aircraft. As you can see, the aircraft has this one Dream Soar decal here, but by the end of it, we're gonna have anywhere, anywhere between 30 to 41 different logos on this aircraft for all our partners and all the people that have supported us to get to where we are today. Now, when you decal an aircraft, you might think it can't be that hard. There's, there's a lot of space on an aircraft to go and, and put all these decals. Uh, and that's not necessarily the case, especially with this Bonanza. We have a very, very nice paint on it. As you can see, there's three different colors here, and then in the back, there's some silver detailing stripes. Uh, we just add some depth and it adds some great color to the aircraft and make it, look, make it look very nice while it's flying and while it's sitting on the ground. And my goal is to not cover up those paint, those paint colors. I don't want to put decals over it that would disrupt the flow of the paint and, and make it look all blocked off and choppy. So my priority is to get as many decals on this aircraft in the right size without covering too much of the paint so that the aircraft still maintains its beauty from the color. Now it's been tough because when you come up with a decal, there's a lot of people with different logos and their logos can be a lot longer than others. Some might be 18 inches wide and two and a half inches tall and some might be nine inches in a circle, which makes it very difficult when you're trying to size them up and have them all be roughly the same size so that way all our partners can be recognized equally for their contributions to our program. All right, so there's another career that I really didn't think about. But isn't that cool? You get to work with airplanes in a hangar and figure out how you want to design this airplane with all the decals. Um, another career that I came across is there's a lot of people that are into designing websites. Um, and, you know, oftentimes we think of, you know, technology and designing and coding. Uh, there, you know, and, and we think of just kind of like the, the general companies out there that have websites, but we don't think about airline or aviation specific websites. You know, it takes someone really special who understands aviation to put together a, a website that really captures the message that these companies want to share with their customers. And for Dream Soar, you know, we are a nonprofit and we're, we're involved in aviation and STEM. Uh, so we were able to find a, an organization called Horsefly, uh, where the owner has a lot of experience in aviation. Her father was a pilot. She totally understood the vision that we needed, and she designed dreamsoar.org, which is a website that you know, was shared all over the world um, as I was flying into these, these countries. So again, more exciting careers out there in aviation that you wouldn't necessarily think about. Finally, I needed a team. When I started to fly, I, I came across this quote that really resonated with me, and I kind of kept it with me throughout the years, and I would, would just say this quote to myself to remind me um, that success is never accomplished alone. You know, yes, I went into this airplane by myself, solo, and I flew it around the world, but to get to that point where I could go inside an aircraft and, and go out there and visit these countries and connect with these children, I needed a team to make sure that, you know, I had my flight permits, the flight plans were filed, 
um, maintenance was available, you know, the fuelers in the countries that I was flying into had the type of fuel that I needed. And all of this was organized by the Dream Store team. And amongst the Dream Store team, we have the Dream Team, which are college students, you know, not too much older than the crowd here today, who had the courage to believe in themselves and the knowledge that they had that they learned in college, and they applied it towards the planning and preparations of the Dream Store flight. So it really doesn't matter what your age is. You know, if you have knowledge and you, and you feel like you've mastered a certain subject, your contributions could affect a global flight around the world. Um, so that, you know, when I look at these college students, I'm inspired by how empowered they are working on such a big trip uh, just by the, the knowledge that they have learned in, in college. So I had the airplane, I had the flight plan, and I had the team. On May 13, 2017, I took off to fly around the world. My destination was Ohio, uh, Columbus, Ohio. And sure enough, I took off. About 15 minutes into the flight, I hear air traffic control saying thunderstorms. You know, thunderstorms over and over and over again. There was a big line of thunderstorms that, I, that my aircraft was tracked to fly into. And when I saw that, I thought, boy, I need to get on the ground quick so I can avoid that weather. So I actually diverted to a city called Jacksonville, Florida, which is just a few miles north of Daytona. And when I got there, um, a really good partner, supporter of Dream Store, Michael Fries, who works for the DEA, uh, met with me because he lives in Jacksonville. And he was able to, you know, I was able to just spend some time with him, talk to him about his flying experience, and just let the time pass before the this, this storm would clear. Uh, so here I am in Jacksonville, and Michael's talking to me about his flying career with the DEA, and it was so exciting. So what he does is uh, he works for, of course, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and he flies um, oftentimes in South America, but really the DEA serves in all parts of the world, and he is monitoring in an airplane for any sort of illegal nar narcotics activity. So here's another career. You know, you're not an airline pilot, you're not an air traffic controller, yet you are monitoring the grounds to make sure that there's no sort of illegal activity, drug activity, that's taking place. So I thought that was really cool. I finally got into the airplane, the thunderstorms cleared, and I was headed towards Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio is a really nice stop simply because um, this was a stop where I was greeted by these two gentlemen. Uh, one is a aviation attorney, the other is an airline pilot for JetBlue. These two gentlemen have flown around the world already in their aircraft that you see right behind mine. Um, the gentleman to the left, his name is Adam Broom, he's the aviation attorney. The gentleman to the right, his name is Adrian Eichhorn, and he flies for JetBlue. And both of these pilots are in aviation, but their main careers, well, at least for Adam, who's an attorney, his main career is not flying. It's being an attorney and having a law practice, but they, on their free time, fly their, their aircraft for fun. Uh, so again, another career in aviation uh, where you could, you could be an, an aircraft um, or an aviation attorney, uh, because if you think about it, there's a lot of planes flying around and the people who own these aircraft or operate them need an attorney on hand to make sure that they are maintaining, operating uh, this aircraft legally. So these two gentlemen both flew around the world. What we did is the day that I was taking off from Columbus, we flew in formation right over Columbus um, with me leading the formation flight, them behind me, and we did a low pass over the runway. And it was like, these past, what they call them, earth rounders, kind of saluting me off to fly to Canada um, as, as an official send-off. Another thing that was really special about Columbus, Ohio, is my mentor, Jerry Mock, the woman that you see in this picture. She flew around the world in 1964. 
1964. This is a day and age where GPS did not exist. And this woman, in a dress, took off in that small aircraft that you see behind her and flew around the world um, to set the record of being the first woman to ever fly, circumnavigate the world. Amelia Earhart attempted it, and unfortunately she didn't succeed, um, but she was able to become the first back in 1964. And I bring up this picture simply because as you start developing you know, what you want to do in life, it's very important to find a mentor, someone who believes in you, preferably someone who is already in the career field that you are in, to kind of guide you and mentor you to make sure that you are on the right track. And I was very fortunate to have Jerry Mock, the first woman to fly solo around the world, as my mentor. From Columbus, I headed to Montreal, Canada. Anybody in here been to Montreal? Okay, I see one hand, maybe two. Very cool. So Montreal is kind of the southern portion of Canada. Uh, it's way up north of the United States. And while there, I got to meet with one of our partners called ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. What's cool about ICAO is they fall under the umbrella of the United Nations, and they handle all of the um, international aviation flying regulations and policies that take place. You know, I kind of brought it up. How is it that Emirates Airlines can fly from Dubai and fly into Orlando International Airport once a day at a very specific time? Well, it is through ICAO that, that Emirates Airlines and the airport authority kind of come with agreements, come to an understanding that, all right, Emirates, you can fly into this airport this many times, carrying X amount of passengers, um, and you can fly in two or three times a week. So all of, all of these policy makings and understandings are all done through ICAO, which is another really exciting career path that you can, t you can go on. In this picture with me is uh, Captain Aisha Al-Hamali, who's a really good friend of mine. She looks very young, but she's a diplomat. Uh, she is the first Emirati female pilot, and she's a really good friend of mine. Um, and right now, she serves as the representative for the United Arab Emirates and ICAO. So really, age doesn't dictate success in life. You could be at any age and you know, be, to even be at a level where you're, you're a diplomat from your country to a United Nations organization. After Montreal, I headed over to Halifax. Uh, Halifax is about 400 miles northeast of Montreal, and I got there, I landed, it was freezing cold. Um, I took this picture during the refueling of the aircraft, getting it ready to fly across the Atlantic Ocean, and my fingers were blue. I, I couldn't really snap this picture uh, simply because of how cold it was. And that day, I was so grateful for the, the gentleman who worked at what they call a fixed-based operator, an FBO, which you find at a lot of airports where they service aircraft that are not um, airline aircraft. So all of the private jets, the small planes, even sometimes military airplanes, where they go when they land at an airport is an FBO, um, and that's where what they call them line service guys, service their aircraft. So I was very grateful for this gentleman who was helping me refuel the aircraft as I was getting ready to fly it across the, um, the Atlantic Ocean. During my stop in Halifax, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Debbie, who's in this picture right behind me. So Debbie has a really cool job in aviation. Uh, what she is is she is a aircraft char charter and air taxi pilot. So what does that mean? What Debbie does is she operates this aircraft from Halifax to an island called Sable Island. Um, and on this island, the majority of the population are horses. <laughs> There's only about two humans who live on this island every year, and really they're there to operate and maintain the horses. And this island has become an environmental and nature 
uh, natural preservation. So there's a lot of photographers that want to fly out to this island, capture these horses who, um, you know, they're all there. They're just breeding and surrounded by the Atlantic Ocean. So what she does as an air taxi, air charter pilot, is she flies people um, from Halifax to Sable. What's so different about air charter is that instead of buying one ticket that you would with an airline, with air charters, you rent an aircraft for a specific trip. Um, so again, another exciting career in aviation that many people didn't know about. From Halifax, I uh, was getting ready to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so you can kind of see down here, Halifax is right above where it says the Atlantic Ocean. Um, I was getting ready to, to, to cross the ocean. I kept thinking about Amelia Earhart. Um, you know, when you get ready to fly an ocean, it's, it's, it's a bit scary, because I had never done it before, and I was by myself. So here I am, the aircraft's fueled up. I inspect the aircraft, I do the pre-flight inspection. The morning of my takeoff, I did an overweight takeoff, meaning <clears throat> this aircraft, uh, is not certified to take off with the weight that I had on board. The reason why I had so much weight was because of all the fuel that I had to carry across the Atlantic Ocean to get me to my destination, which was an island called Santa Maria, right out off of the coast of Portugal. So I went from northern Canada, across the, the Atlantic Ocean, down to Portugal. And because I'm flying overweight, I needed to get an official permit that allowed me to fly this aircraft so heavy. So here I am. I take off. Great takeoff. Uh, it wasn't too challenging. I start flying into the ocean. And have you guys ever been to the ocean and looked out and you just see miles and miles and miles of water and maybe clouds? Well, that's what I was flying into. And I thought, do I see land? Can I see Portugal? And of course, I couldn't. Uh, the distance between Halifax and uh, Portugal, it was close to 1,300 nautical miles. And this leg of the trip was going to take me close to 12 and a half hours. So I'm flying along, and air traffic control says my call sign was November 364 Echo Romeo. That's the, the call sign of the aircraft. So rather than air traffic control saying, hey Shasta, fly this heading, they say, November 364 Echo Romeo, fly this heading. So air traffic control says, November 364 Echo Romeo, uh, from this point forward, you're not gonna have any radio communications. Um, you're gonna have to transition from VHF, which is very high frequency radio communications, which we all pilots encounter when we're flying over land and transition over to HF radio communications, meaning high frequency. The difference is, is VHF uses remote towers to relay messages. HF uses the ionosphere. So if I make a radio call, that call bounces up to the ionosphere and hopefully bounces back to a air traffic control agency that can know exactly where I am and so on. So because I had an HF equipment on board, that meant that on my airplane I had this antenna that would go out from my, the side of my aircraft out to the wingtip up to the tail. It was a big triangle. And so here I am. I'm over the ocean. Air traffic control is saying, all right, no more communications with you, VHF. Transi transition over to HF. Have a great flight. So I'm flying along. And about 300 miles off of the coast from Halifax, you know, I look out, there's nothing but blue water, blue ocean. I'm about 9,000 feet above the, the ocean. I'm flying along, and all of a sudden, my antenna for my HF equipment shears off of the aircraft, slams into the airplane, the body of the airplane, is and is making this thump, thump, thump sound inside the cockpit. And my heart sinks. And the first thing I do is I look down, and what do I see? I kid you not, I see icebergs. And I see ocean, the, the waves crashing, and I think, wow. You know, I, I, I knew things would go wrong on this trip around the world, but I just didn't expect it to be over the Atlantic Ocean. And in a matter of 
I want to say three seconds, I acknowledge that this antenna just came off the airplane, is, is slamming into my aircraft, and I need to turn this plane around and fly to somewhere where there's land and land the aircraft. So, matter of three seconds, this antenna comes off the plane, I turn the plane around, I'm flying towards land, and I have no radio communications with anybody at this point. Um, so it's just me in the airplane and it's quiet. And it, it was a very scary moment. I thought, I'm really out here alone, you know, I, I, over the ocean. Nobody can hear me. And I'm by myself. So I, start, I finally start flying towards land and I identified an airport um, that was the closest to me. And I flew for about an hour and a half and I finally got a hold of, uh, of air traffic control through my VHF system um, that uses the towers. And I, it was, uh, the approach center was Gander Approach. I said, Gander, November 364 at Romeo. I had some issues with my HF antenna. I'm turning around. I'm landing at this airport. Please let the folks at the airport know that I'm coming. And the tower gets on and says, November 364 at Romeo, you're supposed to be flying the other direction. What happened? And I said, um, I'll explain when I get on the ground. Please make sure that there's a mechanic waiting for me when I land. So I landed the aircraft safely, and it was actually at an island called St. Pierre. And St. Pierre, again, is on the coast of Canada, but it, it's, it's a French, it's French territory. So technically, I landed in France, right next to Canada. So it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but you can see this antenna kind of trailing off from the aircraft. I position the aircraft, I shut down the engine, get out of the, air, the airplane, go around to the antenna, and essentially this is what I found. Um, the antenna, it's a 28-foot cable um, that was just completely destroyed. And I'm there outside of the aircraft looking at this antenna and I see a customs agent walking up to me and he's like, Bonjour, uh, where's the pilot? You know, where's the pilot? And I look at him like, um, I am? And he was like, no, I'm a customs agent. Really, where is the pilot? <laughs> and I was like, sir, I'm sorry, I don't look like a typical pilot, but you know, this experience just happened to me over the Atlantic Ocean and I really need to see a, a mechanic. And he looked at me and he said, does your parents know that you're out here flying around the world? <laughs> and I look at him and I said, sir, my parents do know, but I really need to see a mechanic. And he just looks so confused. Um, and Finally, a mechanic came out, detached the antenna, and you know, here are really two other career fields in aviation. One is you could be a customs agent, so you can deal with young women who are flying across the ocean, turning back around, and you won't have to question her, where's the pilot? Um, but the whole purpose of customs agents are to greet incoming international aircraft into the airport, um, and also homeland security. You know. Growing up, I had an interest in FBI and working for the government um, and just ensuring justice and safety within, um, within the United States. And as a Homeland Security officer or employee, you do just that. You're working on ensuring that um, within the United States, security is safe, especially within uh, the transportation and aviation field. And you get to work with, with uh, the government, because uh, it is governmentally operated, on looking at certain different risk assessments, um, just kind of monitoring, you know, is it safe for airlines to fly today? Are there any threats? Um, so that's another position that you could have. So I detached the antenna, and I got into the airplane. And as this is going on, there's another pilot on the field who came up to me and said, hey, I just heard what happened to you. You're flying over the Atlantic Ocean, your antenna comes off, you turn the plane back around, you land, um, and you probably don't want to get back into the airplane because you just had this experience, but you need to get into the plane, like right now, and fly it to an airport called St. John's, Canada which is about 150 miles north of St. Pierre, because weather's coming in, 
And this island used to be a military base, so you're not going to find a lot of hotels and, and restaurants. You need to leave like in the next 10 minutes. And my heart kind of sunk and I thought, wow, I really have to get back in the plane? You know, I just tried crossing the Atlantic Ocean and it didn't work out. Um, you know, to be honest, I thought, I really don't want to fly ever again. <laughs> but here I am, and this pilot is saying, you need to get back into the plane and fly to a different airport. And I thought, all right, I need to react. Got into the airplane. I did a quick pre-flight of the aircraft to make sure that there were no major, um, anything mechanically wrong with the aircraft. Got into the aircraft and uh, flew towards St. John's. And on my way, it was about a, I want to say about a 45 minute flight. I had to ask myself, Shasta, can you fly around the world? Can you do this? Because if you can't right now, if, you, if I were to contact my team on the ground and say, hey, I gave it a shot, you know, this happened to me over the Atlantic Ocean, I'm coming back home, people would understand. And, you know, I thought giving up is, is an option and it wouldn't be failure. Or do I have the confidence, the strength, the bravery to get back into this airplane once it's fixed and fly it across the ocean and fly it really around the world? So I'm sitting there in this airplane flying towards um, St. John's, Canada, and I kept thinking about all the kids who wrote to DreamStore and to me, expressing their happiness, their joy, to see that a refugee from Afghanistan you know, who grew up with, with five sisters in underprivileged Richmond, California, was flying around the world. And their enthusiasm, their excitement, and really presenting me as if I'm, you know, this hero. And I thought, if there was ever a time that I needed to be brave, it's now. And once I land this plane, it's going to be a priority for it to get fixed and me to complete this trip. So... I got to St. John's, Newfoundland, um, and the weather there, I mean, that pilot was not kidding. The weather was coming in, and, um, you know, it just, it was a good feeling to get on the ground and start talking to mechanics and getting this HF antenna fixed. Eventually, the antenna was fixed. I did a second Atlantic crossing, and this time around, I took off from St. John's down to Santa Maria, Portugal. It took a total of nine and a half hours, and it was a success. I got to Santa Maria perfectly fine uh, with, with no issues, and I was so delighted to have gotten the Atlantic Crossing off of my bucket list. Um, in St. John's, you know, one of the companies that really helped me out, because again, this is a foreign country, so finding mechanics was, was a challenge. It was a U.S. registered airplane. Um, so, you know, there's some issues with U.S. mechanics working on foreign aircraft and vice versa. So there's a company um, out in Chicago that really helped me find a mechanic and the materials I needed to replace this antenna. And that company is JSSI, Jet Support Service Incorporated. And what they do is they offer maintenance support to jets around the world. Um, so yet another career in, in aviation. Portugal, uh, I was greeted by a handful of women who were all there just saying welcome to our country. Uh, one of which was an air traffic controller. And when I was flying in, I heard her voice, uh, and she was just really excited, you know, giving me all sorts of direct vectors to the airport. Um, and air traffic control, which some of you may or may not know, uh, it's the folks who direct aircraft as they're coming into an airport and departing to make sure that there's enough separation between airplanes and that the airspace is safe. So that's another career field in aviation. When I got to Spain, uh, that was my other destination after Portugal, Madrid, um, I got to connect with a couple of companies um, that was very interesting. They were involved in aviation, but they weren't directly pilots or mechanics or air traffic controls. One being CEPLA, which is a magazine, it's an aviation magazine that promotes aviation to women. Um, they particularly focus on stories about women in Spain that are successful 
in, in aviation, and it's a way to encourage their next generation to think about careers in, in aviation. Um, I also, when I got to Spain, I had a chance to get the aircraft looked at again by an aircraft mechanic. And having these mechanics around the world available was such a blessing for what I was doing. You know, every time I got the chance to have a mechanic look at the plane, I took it because I thought, you know, I want to make sure every nut and bolt is connected to this plane and it's going to continue to get me around the world. Um, we worked with an aviation museum, which is very nice. Uh, this museum, all these kids that you see in the picture, uh, came out to the museum, got to see the different historical aircraft, learn about the history of, of flight, and that was another career field that I thought was interesting. The staff there, who had known so much about aviation, but they had really never flown professionally. Uh, so that is another career field that you could look into. The Civil Aviation Authority, so each country essentially has a, a civil aviation authority or a federal aviation administration. That's what we have, the FAA. And that is the governing body for, this speci for each specific country to regulate aviation um, in that specific country. So if you have an interest in working for the government, if you have an interest in coming up with policies and rules um, specifically for aviation, this could be a field that you could, you could look into, is working for the Civil Aviation Authority or the Federal Aviation Administration. And also, to flight schools. Pilots need to learn how to fly. If you're a good teacher, you, know, you don't necessarily have to have flight experience. You could teach the basic principles of flight um, to students. So that's another career field that I thought was interesting. So I got into the plane. Um, flew from Spain over to Calgary, Italy, which is a island off of uh, the coast of Italy. And there was, you know, when I landed, there was the airport operations and managers that came to me, uh, that you see in this picture, uh, to welcome me to their country. And now these are folks at airports that make sure that the airport is compliant with the Federal Aviation Administration, with the Civil Aviation Authorities, um, and that everything is running smoothly at the airport, kind of like a manager at a store, making sure the employees are doing their job, the operations are safe. Uh, so they took a quick break to come greet me when I landed in Italy, and I snapped this picture with them and thought, hey, that's a really cool career field in aviation. From there, I flew to Greece, Egypt, Bahrain, and eventually made my way to Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. When I got to the UAE, one of my favorite airlines, Emirates Airlines, has anyone heard of them in here? Emirates, maybe? Very cool. Emirates Airlines hosted me uh, to go out there and take a break from flying the Bonanza and fly a simulator of the Boeing 777. It's called the 777. This aircraft holds about 400 people, so it's completely different from the plane that I was flying around the world. Um, but this video I'll show you, it's really cool because you'll see simulators, which is something that, you know, a lot of people who aren't familiar with aviation, they think pilots do all of their flight training in aircraft. But there's this whole industry dedicated to technology, to building simulators to capture the same experience the pilot would have flying an actual plane and, and give that experience on the ground to pilots who can practice emergency procedures in, in a safe um, environment. So if we could play the video. Hi, my name is Shastaways and I'm the founder and president of DreamStore Incorporated. I'm flying solo around the world to help inspire the next generation of STEM professionals. Hi, my name is Shastaways and I'm the founder and president of DreamStore Incorporated. I'm flying solo around the world to help inspire the next generation of STEM professionals. I'm here today at the Emirates Aviation College and I'm so excited to fly one of my favorite airplanes, 
the Boeing 777. Hi, Hi Shasta. I'm Bachita. We've heard a lot about your dreams or mission, and we also know that you used to flying a single engine <laughs> aircraft. But right. today, you'll attempt to fly a Boeing 777 in our state of art simulator. Are Perfect. you ready? I'm ready. Let's, Let's go. go. Okay, welcome to the 777 300ER sim. It's a conventional aeroplane. As you can see, you've got the control column in front of you, and we've got the two thrust levers here. Left and right engine. Okay. Ready to go? Yes. Let's go. Okay, runway three zero right, takeoff position, flaps five, the checklist is done, you're cleared for takeoff. Put the power on. Wow. Look at us go. <laughs> three zero right. V1. Rotate. Rotate. Woohoo! You're up. It feels great, much faster than my plane. <laughs> I believe you're the first uh, female civilian pilot here in Afghanistan? Yes, yes. So I started a program at my university called the Women's Ambassadors Program. That's a big, uh, it's a mentorship to young girls who are coming in to study. And when I saw the success of that program, I thought, I want to do something global. And that's when I started DreamSoar. That's incredible. Now I decided to become a pilot. My family encouraged me, but at the same time, they had these questions, you know, yeah. how would it go, what will the people say? Right. We don't need all this, you need to pursue your career, you need right. to do good and to prove the world that women can do a lot more. What has been your hardest leg so far? There were times where it was very quiet and isolated, and you just, I, I had this moment where I looked out and I realized I'm really by myself in the middle of the ocean at 7,000 feet and uh, there's nobody out here. So uh, we know that you're going to Mumbai next, so how about we take you there now? Mumbai, runway 27, in the air at four miles, here we go. Okay, so you can watch the approach, the actual approach on uh, YouTube if you type in Emirates Airlines. But I wanted to show you the beginning portion of this video because you saw the Boeing 77 aircraft, the cockpit, I mean it looked just like the airplane but it was in an actual simulator. And with these simulators, you know, as someone who has never flown this aircraft, I got to sit in the pilot seat and, and fly it. Um, and the rest of this video is me flying into Mumbai, which was a scheduled stop uh, in the 777, so I could have kind of an idea of what was to come um, after I left Dubai. When I was in Dubai, um, my next destination was Afghanistan, and I had to leave the aircraft in Dubai because the mountains are so high in Afghanistan that my aircraft didn't have the performance. Um, it could fly in and land, but it didn't have the performance to take off uh, with the fuel that I needed uh, for Mumbai. Um, so I left the aircraft in Dubai, and I took a commercial plane to Afghanistan, and there, I mean, here was a country I left as a little girl, and I constantly read about in, in the newspaper, you know, just kind of following the Afghan-Soviet war, that breaking off, the Taliban taking over. You know, I often would see women and young girls, and I would think, wow, that could have been me. That could have been my five sisters living that life. So for me, it was important to include Afghanistan in the Dream Store Global Flight to go to Kabul and talk to the Afghani girls and tell them that, you know, it doesn't matter really what sort of challenges you come across life. If you persevere and you give, and you give it your all and you put a lot of hard work into whatever you want to do, you can be successful. Um, when I arrived to Afghanistan, my dad lives there to this day. He, he works in, in Kabul. He works for the government. And so I get there, my dad's greeting me at the customs uh, area, and I see this big crowd of people outside. There's probably 300 of them. And I'm like, Dad, what's going on? Is there something going on at the airport? And as we kind of walk out of the customs area, my dad looks at me and he said, they're here to see you. And it was all of these young boys and girls with flowers in their hands, people dancing on the streets, uh, music playing loud, all welcoming me back, which was really, really special. And while in Afghanistan, a lot of the events, um, a couple of the events that, that were planned with these young girls um, to inspire them was all planned with the United Nations um, 
And that's another career field that many people don't really think about. You think of the United Nations. Um, they do have a sector specifically for aviation and development uh, programs where they go into countries and they try to develop their aviation section um, for the locals and get them involved in, in the aviation industry. During my stop in Afghanistan, guess who I got to meet? I got to meet the president of Afghanistan, President Ashraf Ghani, which is the gentleman on the top picture on the left. Um, he gave me a gift. It's a handmade carpet, an Afghani carpet. And there I am in the presidential palace thinking, what? Like, how is this? Is this real life? You know, I'm just kind of pinching myself. Um, and when I met with him, we, we exchanged a few words about women in Afghanistan, women in STEM and aviation. Um, and the whole country was just really excited to support um, DreamSoar, to support me into building more opportunities for women in Afghanistan. The pictures that you see, these girls are all dressed up as pilots in my honor. Um, to this day, there's only been four Afghani women who have had the opportunity to fly ever in the history of Afghanistan. Um, I was the first civilian Afghani female pilot to get a pilot's license. And then after me, there were three other military pilots uh, who flew for the Afghan military. So if you think about the history of this country ever, there's only been four women who have ever flown. And to me, you know, that's just eye-opening. Um, and there are several countries out there like Afghanistan where women just do not fly. After Afghanistan, I went back to Dubai, picked up the aircraft, and I went to Muscat, Oman. Uh, and this was me inside the bus being transported back to my airplane. And it's just a quick Snapchat video that I took of the airport around me. Okay, so lots of desert, lots of plains, lots of sand, um, but that was Muscat. I initially had the intentions of flying into Mumbai, as you saw in the Emirates video, but the weather in Mumbai kept building. Uh, it was during monsoon season, which is a time of the year where Asia, specifically India, experiences a lot of rain. And if you know anything about Amelia Earhart, she was stuck in monsoon season in India for a long time, waiting for the heavy rain to clear off. Um, one of the companies that helped provide weather updates as I was flying around the world uh, is called Universal Weather. And what they did is they had meteorologists monitoring the weather almost every hour, sending me updates about, you know, what are, what are these weather systems doing? And as a pilot who was in India with really poor internet connection for me to look up that, that information, getting these texts of pictures and weather reports uh, was really, really helpful. So this is, um, I didn't get to go into Mumbai. Instead, I diverted, went to Mangalore, India. And this was just a snapshot of just, I was supposed to depart about 10 minutes after the storm and I was delayed for about uh, a couple of hours because of this weather that you're about to see. That's some scary stuff, huh? <laughs> Here are some text messages that they were sending me. Uh, we were using WhatsApp. Um, and it basically was screenshots of satellite images. Um, so again, you know, a career in meteorology, if you enjoy science, if you enjoy weather and climatology, this could be um, an industry or a career field for you that you can go into and help pilots um, around the world with weather updates. Uh, this, this picture was taken during that couple hour delays while I was in Mangalore. I finally did depart Mangalore. I went to Sri Lanka, Colombo, um, and there 
Sri Lanka, um, they were very big on security. Uh, so they gave me an, an, a security staff to kind of get me from the airplane out to, uh, to the airport, go through customs, and then exit to my hotel. Um, and that was really cool. That was a career field that, you know, is very important is airport security um, that was available there to me when I, when I got into Colombo. And then one thing that the government in Sri Lanka organized was for me to go and um, sit inside the cockpit of a Sri Lankan Airlines flight, um, which you see in this picture with these airline pilots. And um, the whole purpose of the flight was for me to see their country, see the surroundings. We took off from Colombo, flew to Sri Lanka, sorry, to, to Singapore, and then back. So that was a cool experience. I took a break from flying the Bonanza um, to go and observe in the cockpit with these pilots um, a flight from Sri Lanka to uh, Singapore. And, you know, that's another career. That's probably one of the biggest careers that you hear about in aviation or airline pilots. Um, but it's very exciting, very fulfilling, and that's probably one of the biggest draws to why people are interested in aviation is by the airline pilots that are flying. Finally, I uh, took off from Sri Lanka, went to Thailand, Phuket, and this is probably one of my favorite um, sections in aviation is the catering uh, sector that's within aviation. So if you like to cook like me and you love food, you know, this is another industry that you can look into in aviation is why not become a chef for Delta Airlines, Air France, um, and, and these catering companies, they pretty much put together a menu for flights leaving from New York to Paris, you know, specifically what, you know, what sort of options, vegetarians, fish, um, you know, all sorts of different menus the catering folks put together. And there's so many catering companies out there. Uh, the company that supported Dream Store and supported me during the global flight it's called Air Culinaire, and throughout each stop, they would provide meals like this for me, which I thought, wow, this is world-class service. Here I am flying to Phuket eating grapes and cheese. I don't even eat this well when I'm, you know, at home. <laughs> so it was a really big treat. Um, and again, that's another career field you can look into. I finally made it to Singapore in the Bonanza. Um, and there I was greeted by the Federal Aviation Administration, uh, which is this picture here on the far right. Uh, the FAA, again, they manage aviation within the United States, and they had an office in Singapore to kind of build the Singapore-United States relationship. Um, and when I got there, they had this big Welcome to Singapore event with kids um, while I was there. And then Textron Aviation, um, this is a company that you all may not be familiar with, but it's the company that manufactures the aircraft, manufactured the aircraft that I flew around the world. Um, so Textron Aviation is the manufacturing company. Um, the Beechcraft Bonanza is the, Bonanza's the type of aircraft that I flew, and then the Beechcraft Bonanza A36 is the model. So if you have an interest in, you know, designing airplanes and, um, you know, working in the factory center, putting these airplanes together, that would be a very exciting career field for you. And you, you never know what these airplanes, where they're going as you're sitting there kind of putting them together. Singapore, my next stop was Indonesia. Uh, I went there, I, we got to do several events with children. Um, these two women that you see here, uh, they work as the aviation and airline compliance officers. So what their job is, is to make sure that the airlines within Indonesia are safe and they're compliant with the regulations that ICAO and their, their civil aviation authorities have put out there. This is a really cool picture. Um, this, on the bottom half of this picture, that's the ocean. And on the top part is the ocean as well. Um, and this was flying through the Pacific region. Here's two bodies of water that's connected, but the colors are so different. Um, this, so after Indonesia, I had the chance to go to Australia, New Caledonia, and American Samoa. 
and this was just one of the pictures that I saw a lot as I was flying in the South Pacific region. I went to an island just south of Hawaii called Air, uh, Kiribati. Um, the locals say Caribus. And this island, it's called Christmas Island, very tiny. I mean, it's almost hard to find it on a map. If you go to Google Maps, you really have to zone in. Uh, only one runway, one small airport. Um, and of course, there was a pilot, which was very surprising at, on this island. And she sure enough was a woman who her and I became really good friends with. And she flew for um, the government, Air Caribus, and she was basically a medical evac pilot. You know, there was probably um, a couple of thousands of people who lived on this island, and a lot of the supplies that would come to this island came from Hawaii in ships in batches of three months. So when someone would get really sick, she was the pilot that would evacuate them from um, Caribus to either Hawaii or any of the nearby countries. After Caribus, I was able to go to Honolulu, Hawaii. And this was, you know, it was getting closer to home. I got to Hawaii, I took the Snapchat um, after some maintenance was done. I did so many checks on the airplane because I had a really big challenge ahead of me, and that was to cross the Pacific Ocean from Hawaii to California. Um, took off from Hawaii, beautiful sky. The flight was 14 and a half hours long. So 14 and a half hours of me sitting in my seat, flying over nothing but blue water, blue skies. I landed in Hayward, California, which is not too far from here, close to midnight. And boy, was I happy to get back to the United States. I, when I landed, I kissed the ground and I thought, this trip is coming to, to a conclusion. When I was in Hayward, the aircraft was completely taken apart, as you see here, again, to do another thorough inspection to make sure that the aircraft uh, was still airworthy. When I got to Hayward, I had a couple of stops in the United States, and I finally made it back to Daytona Beach International Airport, the airport that I took off from. And to my surprise, here I am coming into land. You know, this was it. Once I landed, I would officially become the youngest woman to fly solo around the world. And as I'm landing and my wheels touch the ground, I look to my left and there's this NASA Boeing 747, Sophia, just parked there on the side. And I'm like, what? So this is me um, right in front of Sophia, you know, landing the aircraft and, and getting to the, uh, to the FBO to park the aircraft. In total, I got to meet 3,000 kids face to face to share aviation and STEM with them. Um, so that was three kids, 3,000 kids that either came to the airport or I went to them to introduce aviation and STEM. A uh, total of 32 outreach events. Um, so 32 events around the world um, to introduce kids to STEM and aviation. 30 stops. I had 30 stops total, including the international and the national flight legs. I visited a, a total of 100, or a total of 22 countries. Um, the flight took about a little over 24,000 nautical miles, and it took 145 days of being on the road. And really, my home was that aircraft, and really that, that small section of the plane. So one of, one of the conclusions messages that, concluding messages that I really want to share with you all is I stand up here before you in this shi shiny flight suit and I'm talking to you about traveling the world. And I want to remind you that about 15 years ago, I was an incredibly shy person who again was not an A student, not even really a B student. Um, who just didn't like school, and I thought my future was going to be for me to be a housewife and have children. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I, my eyes weren't open to the opportunities. My eyes weren't open to dreaming, because I thought, I'm not important enough. You know, people like me, they, their dreams don't come true. But I had the courage to 
find something that I really was passionate about, which is aviation. And that slowly built my confidence to get into a plane and fly it around the world. So I challenge you all here today to dream big. Because if I can do it, if I can fly around the world and put a nonprofit organization together and go out there and inspire 3,000 kids, imagine what, what each one of you can do. You know, you all are so different from me and I'm sure more talented than me. Imagine if you were to dream and go out there and fight for your dreams, work hard, not put up with any excuses. Imagine what you all can conquer in this world. So I showed a lot of videos about, or a lot of slides about the trip around the world, but the whole purpose of this trip was to inspire kids. And as we wrap up this presentation, I just want to leave you with some pictures of the kids that uh, were a part of the Dream Store Global Fight. reaching new heights and inspiring people along the way. So come May, uh, early spring of next year, I'm going to be flying this bonanza around the world. Meet Shasta Ways, founder and president of Dreams Soar. She's here at base to share her inspirational story of going from a refugee camp to being the first female civilian pilot from Afghanistan. All right, thank you all for your attention. Does anyone have any questions? And don't be shy like I was when I was a little girl. I want to hear your questions. If you have a question, just kind of come right up to this microphone. <laughs> So we have one brave volunteer. Anybody else? Any questions about the trip, about careers in aviation? Can you share your name? I'm Monique. Um, I wanted to ask, um, was it difficult? difficult for you to like sleep and stuff because you were like up for so long? That is a good question. Yes, so my longest leg around the world was 14 and a half hours and that was across the Pacific Ocean. Um, you know, that was 14 and a half hours of flying, but my day really was almost a 22 hour day because I woke up before, checked the weather. Um, what I had to do is I, I constantly had to monitor what I was eating to make sure the food that I would eat gave me a lot of nutrition, hydrate myself, and sleep whenever I could. But if I ever felt tired or that I couldn't do it, um, that I couldn't fly for that long, I just I would cancel the flight and report back to the team. But taking your care of yourself health-wise, for me, was, was working for me. Um, and, and didn't make me as tired as one would be flying around the world. I also, I also have another question um, about like, what is it? Oh, I 
Um, it's okay. There's so many questions, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> okay. If, well, if you think about it, you can come back okay. up. Thanks for being the first volunteer <laughs> with a question. Good job. All right. We have another question. Um, Your name? I have to say my name. Yeah, sure. Oh. <laughs> Introduce yourself. <laughs> um, I'm Kara. Um, I just wanted to know, like, this is probably going to sound like a weird question, but, like, how are you grooming yourself in the, <laughs> in the plane? Grooming myself? Yeah, like, or... brushing your teeth or something. Oh, yeah. I mean, I had this, this whole setup, and I think the question you're going to is maybe, how did I use the bathroom? Uh, a lot of people ask me that. How did you use the bathroom? Yeah, when you Because <laughs> there is no, no bathroom in this airplane. Um, but, you know, luckily... Aviation, there's been so many people who fly long distances. They created something called the Jane, so you can Google it. Um, but it's an easy way to use the bathroom. And no number twos. <laughs> you know? So I know that this is a kind of an awkward conversation, but um, grooming myself, most of the time, I would, uh, at the hotels, you know, I could always shower. I had access to that. But in the airplane... My favorite thing were um, those Neutrogena facial wipes. They smell so good, and I'd just be sitting there, like, refreshing my face and brushing my hair. And then the trick, too, was that, you know, I'd fly for nine hours during the summertime, and then once I'd land, people would be greeting me. So, like, the hour before the flight, I would start, like, putting some makeup on and, you know, just refreshing myself so I could look presentable. But yeah, it was, it was a challenge. <laughs> so how long were you in the plane? Uh, so the trip was 145 days, but I wasn't flying consistently each day. You know, some days I'd have events, other oh. days I'd rest. Yeah, so I had a lot of stops in between. But for those 14 and a half hour long legs, I mean, you just kind of had to, to work with what, you, what I had, which were wipes and, yeah, perfume and... <laughs> Water, yeah. Okay. It's a good question. Thank, Thank you. you. And your name? Uh, my name is Kayla. Kayla. Um, I wanted to ask, personally, what was the biggest challenge that you really endured during your trip? You know, the biggest challenge, aside from the Atlantic crossing that I endured on this trip, was really having the confidence to do this. You know, it was in my heart. I thought... I want to fly around the world. You know, I was lucky in, in getting all these people to support me. But, you know, when, when things go wrong, you, you almost doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think as women, there's all of this pressure and additional doubt that we have for whatever reason. And one thing that I kept reminding myself is this airplane doesn't know if I'm a man or if I'm a woman, if I have purple hair, if I'm from Africa, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. none of that matters. Be confident, fly that plane. And that challenge that I had with being confident with myself, um, it, it started to progress. And I think it was one of my, my later legs, my flight legs, I thought, wow, I don't even recognize the person that I am in the cockpit just because I had built this confidence level. Um, and to a second note, is sometimes you might not have the confidence to do something, but do it anyways, because that's how you build your confidence. So that was really the biggest challenge personally for me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, first of all, I appreciate you like coming out and talking to us. Absolutely. Um, my question is, uh, like, did you ever feel uh, unmotivated and like giving up? And I'm sorry, if so, like what kept you going? That's a good question. Absolutely. You know, these legs were so long and most of the time I wasn't talking to anybody and I was by myself and it was the summertime, it was hot, there were many weather delays, and I thought, gosh, this is, this is not really fun anymore. Um, but, you know, part of following your heart and doing something that you love, it's so critical in so many ways, but if I really wasn't passionate about inspiring the next generation, I think I would have given up way before I even took off. But 
if you find something that you really love and that you really want to do, that's what's going to get you through the hard days where you, where you just want to be a bum and watch Netflix and, you know, just eat McDonald's. You know, find something that motivates you because it's, it's going to keep your dreams, your energy alive. Um, but there were several times where I thought, oh, I just want to go home already. Um, but I kept thinking about why am I doing this? I'm doing it to inspire young girls and boys to be brave and to go out there and follow their dreams. And that was strong enough to get me motivated and back into the air aircraft. Great. Thank so, you. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Man, this is a supportive crowd. <laughs> Hi, your name? Uh, Michael Sell. Yes. Uh, so about about when going to the trip ball, did you, did you and your students have to face any particular discrimination? So. One more time. If you just step a little closer to the microphone. Okay. So, so we, what about you know, like did students go to the trip ball? Thirty students. Did did, did you and they had to face any particular discrimination going to those countries? Luckily, every country, and I mean every country that I landed in was very open and accepting. I mean, I didn't, I thought, well, here I am, a woman from Afghanistan, you know. It just, I thought I should be worried because, you know, there might be some discrimination towards me, especially me flying this plane. Um, but to my surprise, everybody was very open, you know, even, even some of the men in Afghanistan who had one way of thinking about a woman's role you know, having their support too. It was overwhelming. Um, and one thing I did before I took off on the trip around the world, I was watching the news a lot and I'd see a lot of, you know, scary moments on TV where I thought, gosh, the world seems so scary. But once I got out there and I landed in these countries and I felt the love from every single person, I thought the world really is a special place and what makes it so special are its people. And there's a lot more love out there than, than what I expected. So I didn't really get to see a lot of discrimination. Really mm. none. That's a good question. OK, then. Thank you. So my, uh, my name is Giselle. Giselle. Um, and your dream was to inspire people, correct? Yes. Okay. So you stand here today and you tell people that this is what you've done. And of course, you've inspired people today because I am one of those. Aww. And my, you, you've done what you wanted. You, you've accomplished your dream. And you show everyone today, this is what I've done. And what happens now? That's a good question. You know, dreaming, it's something that always happens. It doesn't have to end once your dreams come true or you accomplish a goal that you have. Um, important things for dreams for me is that in the next few months, DreamSoar wants to give out scholarships to young boys and girls around the world to empower them. So if you want to go on a discovery flight at your local airport to get in the, the air and see what flying feels like, you know, those scholarships will exist for young girls um, through DreamSoar, which these scholarships will be established and available in the next coming months on DreamSoar.org. But for me, I love to fly. So I'm going to continue to fly and continue to go out there promoting aviation to women um, around the world. If you saw the route, I didn't really go into South America or even really Africa. Yeah. And there's so many regions of the world that I think needs attention. And I feel like my purpose, yes, is to fly because that's my passion. But my purpose is to bring aviation to people who don't necessarily have it and, and get them excited about life and excited about dreaming. So I wish I had a, an exact answer for you, but I think it's still coming together. And it's okay if you don't have it all figured out. 
um, earlier in the crowd, people were saying, well, I don't know what I want to be yet. Mm -hmm. And hey, I didn't know what I wanted to be until I was a senior who graduated from high school. So these things come as they go. Um, but the future is going to be very much similar, flying and inspiring young kids. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is uh, Robert. Robert? And um, if you could travel again, what would be your first destination? That's a good question. If I could travel again, like on the places that I've been to around the world already? Yeah, if you could uh, do it again. That's a hard one. You know, I was really inspired by Egypt. Um, I had the chance to go and see the pyramids. Yeah. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at these massive pyramids and I'm thinking to myself I cannot believe in that day and age they built the technology to build these pyramids and they still stand strong to this day I mean imagine the science that had to go into building those pyramids the exact math equations on how to position them to make them so symmetrical you know engineering equipment and and so that you know building this infrastructure would be safe I mean, to me, I, sta I was standing there in front of the pyramids just blown away that these pyramids, are, they stand so strong and they've been there for so long and they're just amazing, beautiful. So I, I definitely want to go back there. And I got one more. Uh, I seen the picture of uh, American Samoa. How, how is that? It was the Samoan people are unlike any people that I have met, very warm, welcoming. I mean, it was the, the food, the music, it was amazing. I met so many young girls there who um, really didn't want to fly, but I think aviation interested them, and I think slowly aviation will, will build there. But are you from there? I don't yeah. know. Okay. Yes. You have to go someday. It's Un unbelievable, such an amazing gem island um, that I fell in love with as well. Yeah, all right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Edgar. Um, if your organization is nonprofit, how would you be able to fund your expedition? That's a good question. Maybe we'll have a, a nonprofiter here <laughs> very soon. So. Essentially, what nonprofit means is that whatever we are providing, whatever service we are providing to the public, uh, we don't make any sort of cash or any sort of financial benefit from it. So, the funds that we use, what we do is, or sorry, the funds that we raise, we recycle that into fulfilling the inspiring the next generation. So, we built all of this funding, and you know, we don't take that money and go to um, the mall and, and spend it there. We take that money and we invest it back into the organization to get us to fulfilling our mission, which is inspiring the next generation of STEM and aviation professionals. So a portion of those donations went to the global flight and the cost affiliated with hosting these events with children and the fuel and the flight permits. And then now a portion of that is going to building scholarships for young kids. So. Very good question. Do you, do you have another question, I no, think? I no? OK. Hi. So my question is, after your flight, what happened to your plane? Like, did it go in a museum, or do you still fly it? <laughs> That's such a good question. So we are a nonprofit, DreamSoar, and we were leasing the aircraft um, from a organization actually here in the San Diego area. So you might see it flying one day over the sky. Uh, so the airplane is not going into a museum. We had to return it, and the owner is going to maybe sell the aircraft. But it was hard to step away from the airplane because it had been my home for five months around the world. And a couple years before that, I was flying it every day. But to me, I thought, you know, it's a machine. Um, there's going to be so many of them out there. It was the, the purpose of the trip. It was the, the mission of inspiring kids. That, that's why I was in it. That's why I was flying around the world. Um, so, so the airplane, you know, who knows? It could be flying over us right now, for all we know. Um, but 
to kind of bring to your attention, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum uh, is going, well, already has my name engraved in their wall of honor. Um, so there's a little bit of history, you know, out there that's recorded. Thank you. But thank you for your question. All right. Well, you guys were awesome. Thank you so much. Please visit our website, dreamsoar.org, to learn more about uh, the flight. You could also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, I mean, all the social media platforms. Um, don't forget to dream, to believe in yourself, to be confident, and thank you again for your time. Take care. Thank you for your attention and your questions. You're, you're, you're a fabulous audience. And uh, another round for, of, of applause for the National Business <laughs> Aviation. In the uh, coming days, we're going to send out the scholarship information for the seniors. Um, the National Business Aviation Association and Dispatchers have a scholarship program that we want you to, to take part in. And if you do, would you please email me because um, at pdavis at lbschools.net so I can follow up with those kids who do the scholarship so I can uh, talk with Ms. Fincham and Ms. Whitaker so they can provide follow-up for you. So please do that. So at this time, we're going to ask the teachers who accompanied you here to lead, lead you out and meet your buses at the location. And thank you again for being here.